Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Genevieve Johnson. I'm the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, we are recording this webinar today um, using some new software that we've used in the past. So if you have been with us on previous webinars, um, this platform might look a little bit different to you. If you have any questions at all, please type them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them as we go along, um, either about the software or questions from our presenter today. Um, we are very lucky today to have Jeff Burgett. Um, he is going with the Pacific Islands Climate Change Cooperative. Uh, he is presenting on scales and island realities in their region of the LCC network, which is the Pacific Islands. Um, Jeff has been the science coordinator for the Pacific Islands Climate Change Cooperative since 2010, and he's responsible for designing and administrating the science development program, which is really in working to inform climate change adaptation of marine and terrestrial resource management with all of their partners. He has a BA and a PhD from the University of Hawaii um, and a MSc from the University of Auckland. And he has mainly focused on marine ecology, which of course makes sense being in the Pacific Island region. Um, prior to his current position, he worked on endangered species map. Uh, management and population modeling, invasive species, avian disease, coral reef management, and environmental impact reviews. One of the reasons that we asked Jeff to present today for our landscape conservation design series is to really talk about this issue of scales and uncertainty as we move forward in landscape conservation design. Um, we've been able to learn a lot from different participants across the Landscape Conservation Cooperative Network. Um, and the Pixie, as they are affectionately known, um, has been working um, successfully with partners dealing a lot with uncertainty, not only with climate change, but also um, in being able to look at design issues related to um, islands and marine systems. So again, um, welcome everybody. Welcome Jeff. Thank you for presenting today. I do want to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar. Um, everybody has been muted right now. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. If you need, if you can't find it, if you kind of scroll down to the bottom of your screen, um, it, a little toolbox will pop up and you'll see a little chat icon, a little bubble. If you click on that, it'll pop up on uh, usually the right side of your screen and you can go ahead and uh, uh, type anything in there. I'll be monitoring that throughout the day. Um, and then at the end, we'll also ask for additional questions. We'll try to unmute everybody um, if you can't type anything, uh, your question in. Um, after we are done recording today, um, we'll be processing the webinar and um, have it up on our YouTube channel. So with that, welcome up to you again, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Genevieve and thanks Ashwin. Um, uh, Ashwin contacted me and asked me to talk a little bit about our approach to LCD in the islands uh, because of it, it's just such a different environment but maybe has a lot of um, contrasts and comparisons that might be useful for you. So as we talked um, and I kind of explained our, our uh, situation, the, the kind of um, scope of this talk became a little broader, so forgive me a bit if it strays from just strict LCD discussion. So here's what I'm planning to talk about. Um, I'm first going to give you kind of the, the setting and the issues and some of the constraints that are inherent in working in the Pacific Islands. Uh, talk about landscape conservation design and how it works and how the Pixie strategic plan works in that environment. Um, talk especially about climate change impacts and landscape conservation design, and specifically about three particular climate change impacts um, and trends that we see. One, in temperature and precipitation, um, sea level rise uh, at the coast, and coral bleaching. So we go from the terrestrial to the coastal to the marine. And then I'll wind up with some concluding thoughts. So first of all, the Pixie membership um, is quite broad. We have about we have 30-some organizations now. Um, they involve not only the, the 
familiar um, federal agencies, but uh, Native Hawaiian organizations, uh, NGOs such as uh, Trust for Public Lands and uh, Nature Conservancy, um, and then an American Bird Conservancy, and then um, a couple, well, one especially, um, Kamehameha Schools is a very um, large landowner in the state of Hawaii. It's a, it's a private educational foundation set up for um, Hawaiian students. And we also have the Micronesia Conservation Trust, which is a large umbrella conservation organization that works in the Micronesia area, which is um, to the west of Hawaii. So here's a map of our uh, Pacific uh, Pixie region. Uh, it includes a U.S. state, two territories, um, the territory of Guam and American Samoa, uh, a commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and three independent countries, which are in yellow, the uh, Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, or FSM, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, or RMI. Um, so here's the first contrast of scales. The, the area is huge. I mean, we, we span five time zones, but the actual physical area above water is very small. Um, the largest island is Hawaii Island, where I'm standing right now, um, and called the Big Island, and it's about the size of Connecticut, but a lot of it is upper elevation lava fields that are essentially just barren uh, rock, and so the actual inhabited area of these islands is very small. Um, the ocean, of course, div uh, both divides the islands, separates them, um, and, but it uh, forms a linkage both for marine species, which can traverse that area relatively easily, and uh, humans as they settle these areas. So the, the area was settled from the, the um, west uh, and Southeast Asia and, and Australia um, towards the east. And so state of Hawaii was one of the last, um, the islands of Hawaii were one of the last to be colonized, and that was about uh, the year 1100. Um, and so the region consists of both low coral islands and high volcanic islands. So despite this huge area, uh, and because the islands are themselves are small and remote, the island economies are tiny. Here's the capital of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. It's not particularly imposing. Um, and I, I added all the GDP up, and it's about the same as the city of New Orleans. Um, so that's, this entire region has the economy of the city of New Orleans, and of that, Hawaii is 94% of that. So what that means is the capacity for management of these um, of natural resources is low, and the research capacity is also low. Um, there are nine indigenous languages spoken in the region, uh, reflecting the, the colonization history by Micronesians and Polynesians. Um, all of these islands were colonized later by European powers and later some by the Japanese. The U.S. became the dominant power in the region in, after World War II. The political systems include Western um, as well as traditional governing arrangements, and sometimes those overlap. However, even though the... Um, even though the state of Hawaii is, uh, has a large uh, native Hawaiian population, a curious thing here compared to the mainland U.S. is that native Hawaiians don't have any political representation separate from just being citizens of the state. So there are no tribes in Hawaii. So the native Hawaiians are actually working towards recognition and self-government, but that has yet to occur. So these species and human cultures evolved in relative isolation, and the most extreme is Hawaii, which is the most isolated archipelago on Earth. The native species of these small tropical islands are often really specialized for particular habitats, and most endemic uh, plants and insects are found only on one island. Only a handful of the thousands of species native to this region are shared with North America, since they're essentially their North American species are rare migrants here. So uh, much less work has been done on the species here. There's not a base of knowledge about the species in these ecosystems as much as on the mainland. And so basic information on their ecology, and especially their climatic tolerances, is often non-existent. Um, much of the conservation work in Hawaii has been focused on the spectacular forest bird fauna, um, all of which are endemic and uh, descended from a few colonizing species millions of years ago. Hawaii even has an endemic seal. Um, but because of the small uh, size of these islands and the fact that they're divided into various microhabitats, um, most populations of these species are small because the habitats are small. For example, there are only about 1,200 um, 
uh, monk seals right now. They're endangered, um, but there probably never were more than a few thousand of them. So the region has over 400 endangered species and many, of, um, many species that are already extinct. These losses were driven mostly by introduced native species after the initial human colonization. Um, there were no native mammals on these islands, so the, so the native plants lost their chemical and thorn defenses over evolutionary time. Uh, introduced herbivores basically landed in a salad bar and have just laid waste to much of the vegetation in the islands. Predators such as rats, cats, and mongoose have driven many birds to extinction um, because they were also not ready, they have no behavioral defenses against mammalian predators. Um, so isolation is what defines the islands and shapes the life within them. Um, breaking that isolation puts the islands in jeopardy. And basically, in, invasive species arrive on islands and spread within islands through the process of connectivity. Uh, basically, humans provide connectivity that was lacking before. So as a rule, island conservation doesn't focus on restoring connectivity like a lot of conservation on the continents does, but instead on restoring isolation. Uh, most forest bird populations are now restricted to upland forests, uh, which are too cool for the survival of these non-native mosquitoes that have been introduced. And also there's an introduced malaria parasite that is fatal to most of the birds. So conservation of native forest birds is both um, uh, spatial and, and also dealing with the threat of, of disease. Um, because of this process, there's been a re recent historical loss of both biodiversity and traditional culture that's based on biodiversity. For instance, here's a painting of Hawaiian chiefs as they appeared about 200 years ago when, we, when Europeans arrived. Um, the, the feather cloak is essentially their crown jewels. It was formed by tens of thousands of forest bird feathers. Um, and many of the feathers that went into these capes uh, belong to birds that are now extinct, like the Hawaii o'o. Because people live at the coast, um, in general, the lowlands are highly invaded or completely alien, um, and the uplands are more intact. So this is a picture of the island of Molokai, and you can see both the, the, the rainfall gradient, but also um, the lower areas are completely denuded by um, grazing by invasive species. Um, the, so the intact uplands are basically um, are the, the focus of the conservation efforts on the, these high islands, and so it's been about protecting those watersheds and battling the invasive species in those areas. Um, since the 1970s, a lot of this activity has been driven by the Endangered Species Act and funded by federal dollars from the outside. Um, there's some hostility to these conservation activities here. People are putting up a, a fence to keep out feral pigs from native forest, um, but there's a lot of hostility there because, um, largely because of hunting restrictions. Um, basically, these areas become uh, pig-free and therefore no longer available for subsistence or recreational hunting. Um, and the thing is that fences are very expensive to put up and uh, wire cutters are pretty cheap. So there's a constant battle of, for hearts and minds and also not to waste money in areas where these fences are just not going to be supported by the local population. Um, Traditional management by communities um, happens in local areas where there's, so everybody is um, kind of focused on their local area. And there's now some revival of conservation of coastal resources. And there's a term in Hawaii called kuleana. Um, kuleana is a Hawaiian word. It has a really profound meaning. It's a, it's a blend of um, rights and responsibilities. So if something is your kuleana, you have the right to enjoy it, um, passed on usually by, by your family ties to the land, but also that comes with the responsibility to care for it. So here's an example from the island of Molokai. Uh, these, there were a, a, a large number of coastal fish ponds that were um, developed for aquaculture, uh, pre-European -con, pre contact. Most of them date from the 1500s, and they've been invaded by, um, by introduced mangrove, and the uh, mud from the denuded uplands due to grazing has kind of invaded the and washed into these fish ponds and rendered them less usable. So there's a lot of work now on um, on restoring these fish ponds for self uh, for sustaining the local population. Um, but what the people have found is that you can't just focus on that 
part of that um, dealing with that problem requires reforesting the, the uplands where a lot of the sediment is coming from. So the, the communities that are taking on their kuleana of, of dealing with the watershed as a whole. So that's sort of a, a landscape conservation design that's at the very local scale. It's kind of organic. Um, but interestingly, we think that may have more staying power than something um, initiated by outsiders because this is you know, taken on as a, as a community uh, responsibility. The landscape conservation design promise is that there's, it's a way to collectively envision the future and work to make it happen by focusing on what we do, where we do it, and who can best do it. Um, in a nutshell, that's how we think of it. And, but some issues on islands are that the ranges of these species are very small. And the fact that they're endemic to a single island or even a single mountain on an island limits the landscape options available for conservation of, of these rare species. Um, each island is unique. Um, it's naturally bounded by the ocean. And therefore, it's a different LCD problem. Um, or even uh, parts of islands are, are the correct scale. So we can't look at this as a regional problem. Each island, each particular island, presents a set of challenges because of different native species, different invasive species suites that have uh, established there, and different politics and, and culture. So there's, there's a limit to the LCD effort that any large organization can do just because it's fragmented into such small bits. Um, but um, the good thing is that climate change acts as a unifying theme for the islands. The idea of landscape is kind of alien to island populations because they are used to thinking in small scales. But everybody's dealing with climate change. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a feature that's obvious to almost everybody here. There's almost no denial or, um, or you can't, it's very difficult to find anybody that's not concerned about it. So that acts as a kind of a, uh, a way to focus people's attention and think about um, work at the landscape scale, at least as it applies to islands. The Pixie was established specifically to deal with climate change, and here's the purpose, to assist those who manage native species, ecosystems, and cultural resources in adapting their management to climate change for the benefit of the people of Pacific Islands. So that's in our charter. Um, we had a recent um, strategic plan development, which really allowed us to kind of focus on how, how you actually accomplish that. Um, and what we found is that when you, we really break it down and look at a kind of a logic chain, um, there are two goals inherent in what we're doing. And one is that we are aim to provide assessments, tools, techniques, and provide them to the people that can make decisions and, and, and uh, take action on climate adaptation for these resources. So that's, that's kind of what many people think of what the LCECs do. Um, but we also realized that that was useless without a second goal, and this taking place at the same time, which was that you um, develop the conditions uh, to, to allow that, those changes to occur, because adaptation means change, and most of these organizations are not set up for change. They're set up to perpetuate their system, so um, basically it takes a lot of work to get people to accept the need and take on this role of changing their, their um, way of going about business. So um, with climate change it comes uncertainty, and I'll illustrate that with some examples here. Um, first off, um, global climate change is going to impact Hawaii in ways we can't fully predict. Being tropical, temperatures at a given elevation don't vary very much. So most of the climate impact on the terrestrial systems is expected to be through changes in rainfall. Um, due to their small size and terrain dependent climate, climate is really dependent on where, where you are in the trade wind flow in terms of elevation and rain shadow at a very small scale. Um, the islands are really a challenge for climate models. To actually accurately do it, we've had to develop downscaling techniques down to 1,000 or 800 meter resolution, which is pretty crazy, but that's what it really takes to, to work at these scales. So we've got two uh, downscaling model results that we're working with, and they're not the same. So um, in terms of people wanting to know what the precipitation is, here's one model. 
um, wetter on the windward side, the northeast side, somewhat drier on the leeward side. Um, and here's another model, which shows a much higher rate of drying um, and uh, even drying on the wet side. So um, this is, those are very different pictures. Um, and so that's, that's some basic uncertainty as to what, what we're facing. Um, so uh, we don't know which one of these is more likely. Um, it's apparent that keeping other elevations free of invasive species won't do it. Habitats are going to shift and become inhospitable to the species that currently live there. It's always been assumed that you keep the bad guys out and everything will, will thrive in its, its former home, and that's no longer true. Um, we've looked at now at some combining temperature precipitation patterns and looking at uh, future habitats. So this is a biome model that, that Pixie has done. Um, and I'm just going to show the different um, futures. Here's uh, in 21 headed under one model, another model, and another model. So anybody that's looking at a very fine scale, which is the scale at which people operate here, um, they're trying to figure out exactly what the future holds for that particular area that they're dealing with. And these are, these are major changes I'm illustrating here, which is, you know, transition from dry forest to mesic forest, dry shrubland. I mean, this is, this is major changes. And so people really don't know how to, how to prepare at a very fine landscape scale, which they work at. Um, but we're working through this, and we're about a year into a process um, that is going to develop into an LCD based on these um, projections. And we call it the Hawaii Islands Terrestrial Adaptation Initiative, or HITI. Um, we have three projects going on with that. First is the climate synthesis project, basically taking what we know about climate, as I've just illustrated here, and synthesizing these potential changes and their impacts and working people through um, some scenario planning around that um, to, you know, and this is more kind of the goal one, the technical um, information. And now looking at kind of the goal two, the preparing people to actually make this change, um, we're also doing an analysis of current policies, institutional relationships, and management practices that affect adaptation. Basically providing people with a roadmap of potential barriers and potential wins um, and ways around those barriers that would help people work on adaptation. And in order to kind of change people's mindset, we're working on video case studies that we'll put up on uh, a lot of different media um, of actions that are already being taken by managers to address climate change, basically to, to mainstream the idea that it's not this weird new thing. Uh, people are actually doing this already. Uh, they're taking this information, they're applying it to their work, so you should too. Um, so in contrast to the uncertainty in the distribution of rainfall and species responses to that change, um, the exposure of coastal areas to sea level rise is much simpler. Because we know from basic physics that sea levels will rise, and that rise will accelerate for centuries because of the warming that's already occurred and is ongoing, it's really a question of when a given area near the coast will be impacted, not if it's going to happen. So there's various scenarios, but they all share a very monotonic increase feature. So it's not about um, when, it's about, it's about exactly when something will happen rather than if it will happen. Um, and so, the, uh, so we have the certainty of impact, and, but the uncertainty of time. And some, prob some of these, that makes some of these um, issues amenable to uh, LCD and some not. And here's one that's not really. So this is in the Republic of Marshall Islands. It's the capital city of, uh, and atoll of Majuro. Um, this is the runway, the only basic ac air access to this um, island. And it's also the main water catchment for the island. And you can see that it's like a meter above sea level. And it's been in, actually been impacted by um, high tides recently. So these, uh, these people are facing major flooding at, now at high tides that hasn't happened before. Um, and it's really impacting life on these islands. So seawater inundation like this leads to a loss of crops um, and, and contamination of groundwater. These are taro crops that have been flooded by seawater and destroyed. 
Um, and eventually, it's going to lead to the loss of homes and entire nations as people are forced to leave their islands and become climate refugees. So there's no spatial planning that's going to help that situation. Even on high islands, there's going to be cultural impacts due to a loss of immovable features, like these uh, temple platforms in Hawaii. Um, they were actually, when they were constructed about 500 years ago, they were well inland. And, but as this island sinks and now accelerated with sea level rise, these, these, these painstakingly restored um, cultural icons are going to be eventually just overwhelmed by um, the ocean and destroyed. So um, cultural aspects, cannot be, some of them cannot be moved. Some of them which are practices, like the age-old practice of, of making sea salt, um, which is handed down through the generations on the island of Kauai, um, that can be, that's a practice that just needs an appropriate place to happen, but it, right now it's tied to a particular place that's not going to be suitable in the near future. So that's impacting both, you know, um, people's livelihoods and cultures. So, um, but for seabirds and um, monk seals and sea turtles, um, the loss of these coastal habitats to sea level rise is more existential. And a conservation approach that deals with this um, does definitely involve some landscape level planning. So um, the, because these species are confined to these islands because of predators, basically introduced predators have extirpated them from the inhabited islands, um, we are basically thinking of dealing with that problem at a, at a scale of entire islands. Here's the island of Koho'olawe. Um, which is uninhabited, it's pretty bleak and was used as a bombing range. But uh, there's um, a lot of work going on uh, removing all the predators from that so that it can become a bird refuge island. Um, and we've also created, and on three sites on the coast, created um, pest-free areas using these predator-proof fences that were developed in New Zealand. So these are, are basically proof against everything from cats and dogs down to mice that can't penetrate the fence. So you can essentially create an offshore island refuge on the main islands. But of course, these require constant upkeep. Um, finally, another challenge. Um, this one features both certainty in location and relative certainty in time. And you may have heard about the Great Barrier Reef recently and the um, coral bleaching that's going on. The uh, rising ocean temperatures are causing more severe and prolonged episodes of coral bleaching, which weakens and can ultimately kill coral. As coral forms the structure of coral reefs, like trees create the structure of the forest, as the, when the corals are lost, it devastates the entire ecosystem. Coral reef collapse due to bleaching will lead to loss of biodiversity and human food supply as fisheries decline and uh, the loss of the coral reefs dissolve and eventually degrade, and that loses the shoreline protection that they provide from storm waves. So some Pixie-funded research showed that business as usual emissions will lead to uh, annual severe bleaching within 30 years for most of the region. So this is a timeline of when annual severe bleaching, which is incompatible with coral reef survival, is expected to occur um, using our, our current climate models that are the IPCC models. So you can see most of the region is looking at reef loss by the 2030s, Hawaii maybe a decade later, and the northwestern Hawaiian islands up to the left of the main islands of Hawaii um, maybe a decade after that. So um, this is, is without carbon mitigation. <coughs> Unfortunately, um, we uh, it, even um, even strong mitigation, uh, like RCP 4.5, only delays this picture by about a year, or sorry, a decade. So we have both certainty of effect, pretty much certainty in time, um, and really no, no options in terms of dealing with it. You can't change the temperature of the ocean. You, know, you can't create an island further north where there is none. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, we are funding an LCD in Hawaii right now that relates to this, and what we're doing is looking for um, areas that are probably less prone to bleaching in the short term so that we can focus areas where um, 
the management of the herbivore fish that keep the reef clean and help the coral reefs recover from leaching episodes, that those areas can be focused for management. But it's, a, it's realized that it's a stopgap measure and we're eventually going to lose reefs throughout the Pacific, including Hawaii. So um, that's going to depend on community participation and support for those sort of management actions. So we've seen that the scale of islands and their isolation affects the ecosystems there and the cultures that are linked to those ecosystems and the conservation challenges and solutions. So there's a lot of things about scale that really affect what is possible and what the problem is. But we found that climate change is a good, um, good lens to focus LCD efforts on the somewhat limited options available in the future. So I thought I'd just kind of wrap this up by coming up with some parting thoughts here. Um, we found in, in one of our, the analysis, the adaptation analysis that's part of our adaptation initiative for the Hawaiian Islands, um, one of the found things they've really realized is that Hawaii as a whole does not have a real culture of um, collaborative planning. Most of the areas that are, are, are um, worked on for conservation are relatively small and within the ownership boundaries of one or maybe at most two organizations. And so the efforts tend to be at the scale of, of, a, of a single organization's ownership, be, be it the national park or um, a wildlife refuge, but still uh, it can happen within a silo essentially. And so we don't have this large landscape planning culture um, that needs to be developed and fostered. So that's, that's really um, a focus of our, that goal too. Um, creating the partnerships and fostering the partnerships that help this uh, uh, or increase our ability to create adaptation at a larger scale. Um, we, we have been able to use these climate change scenarios and the uncertainty that's inherent in them to, uh, re to force people to look at their existing goals and to reassess their goals. Because um, too many times I think people fixate on Okay, here's our, here's our goal. How do we achieve it? Oh, now let's look at climate change. In fact, some of the, some of the flow diagrams for, for planning for climate change have that actually as part of it. It's like climate change comes in after you've set your goal. Whereas we found that really you have to look at climate change and its potential impacts to really understand whether your goals are realistic at all. And so as you're developing these collaborative efforts, you can actually turn to the climate models and use this as a, as a, a teaching tool or a thought process to say, is this, is this a realistic goal? Um, if you're, for instance, you, you have a species that's only found at the top of one of these ridges because below it is too warm and then you're going to, the temperature is inevitably going to increase, these, these species are going to be essentially forced off the top of the mountain. What is, your, what is your plan for that? Is, that a re, is maintaining that population a realistic goal? And the, I think looking at the problem as we've done in our strategic plan as needing those two interrelated activities, that's been very helpful to us. So again, one is focused on the development and use of technical tools and ways of, of um, uh, thinking through problems. And the other end is focused on helping the institutions embrace and act on those tools. And that is a role that the LCCs can play that perhaps no other organization is actually able to do. Um, but it takes a little focus on uh, an assessment and kind of a, a clear-eyed uh, vision of your, both where you want to go and the potential barriers to at the organization and between organization level that keep you potentially from changing um, how you've approached the problems up to now. And with that, I'll say aloha and mahalo, thank you, um, and I'm ready for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, we, of course, are, are facing uh, the same big big theme issues um, and trying to create tools that partners can use and then also um, really trying to create the partnership that supports 
not only use of those tools, but um, open discussion. Um, so folks, if you have questions for Jess, if you could please um, type them in the chat box. Um, and um, Jeff, while we wait for a couple, um, well, we have one from, from Matt, which is, um, how do you maintain stakeholder participation given the dire projections for key ecosystems for stakeholders? That's actually a, a real important issue. Um, and we, <laughs> there are, um, there are, the more dire, something is and the fewer options available, um, the less people te tend to want to engage in that and, and mostly they tend to focus on keeping doing what they're doing because that's what they've always been doing. Um, so uh, it is a challenge. The, the, we tend to emphasize um, the contingent nature of a lot of these, that the fact that the, the Answers are not written. You know, the, there's a lot of, of potential options in terms of, of how um, climate change will play out. Um, and that's especially true of, for instance, like the, the rainfall issues. Um, there's just so much uncertainty there that we have to play it for a, a variety of options. But um, sea level rise is getting a lot of attention because it's a time problem as opposed to a, a um, weather will happen problem. And the focus, unfortunately, the focus on most of that, in my mind, unfortunately, is that most of it's about infrastructure. And that's where almost all the discussion is because people live at the coast, they interact at the coast, that's where their houses are. Um, but what we really have is we have to realize that we have a very short window in some of these um, cases between the time that people become aware of it and the time people spend all their time thinking about the human aspect of it. So there's a, a very uh, short window where natural resources are um, both, you know, uh, at risk and known to be at risk and still and relevant from a, in terms of funding. So um, we're trying to do that. We're trying to focus on on what we need to do um, to help uh, coastal communities, uh, natural communities respond to that. Um, and, and especially before the um, people really get into the business of moving roads and um, other assets away from the coast. Um, the difficulty is that the rate of change is unknown, um, but that will become clear over time. Uh, so, but for things like the coral reef stuff, people really, frankly, we've had a hard time engaging people on that because it's so bad they don't want to think about it. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, is the micro-modeling tool used for these islands available for other use? For example, I'm in the southwest and we also have Sky Island microclimates. Yeah, well, probably. Um, the the I could um, give you the information and the uh, links to the um, the researchers that are doing this, um, and I think they've been talking to folks at the um, I know the Southeast Climate Science Center because people in the Caribbean islands were also interested in this, um, but I'm sure they were also they could also talk to the folks and um, at uh, in the Southwest um, National. Uh, the NCAR people from Boulder have also worked on this, but their model doesn't particularly work very well. Um, so, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to I, obviously I'm not the climate modeler, but um, I'd be happy to share that information with you for sure. That would be really great. And we have a couple of folks who would be very interested in that. Um, and then we have a comment from Ron. Um, so landscape is not a scale. The boundaries of a landscape are defined by the people who live, work, and play in that area as what's inside is important to us and what's outside is less important. And from there, you have a scale for landscape conservation design analysis um, as opposed to potentially the other way around. So 
the comment is that the LCD community needs to start using the term in this way so that locally affected people feel included um, and not excluded just because we think a landscape is something bigger than what we used to think of it is. Um, human society set the boundaries for assessments and that sets the geographic scale. So making sure that landscape is a social ecological type, not just geographic scale. Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I do want to say that um, what I, I probably meant was that the, the term itself is unfamiliar to people here. Um, so constantly using that term, you're trying you essentially are, are introducing another term for something that they already think about. So it's, it, we haven't been aimed at that. Um, the Hawaiian uh, land division system uh, was based on on resource access and essentially divided the islands into pie-shaped sections where the you had coastal, upland, and mountain resources available to people living in that. So there's a natural um, political and, and ecological organizational scale that the, um, that the Polynesians and Micronesians have developed over time. So that those are the kind of discussions we usually have. At, that's where people feel their kuleana is, is within that, um, their, their, um, the area they're, they were born in. Um, so, but yeah, but uh, the one thing I did want to say is that, that um, LCD, the LCD problem is very different from one island to another. And so it's that the island boundary itself is a, is a, is a fixed, real, um, ecological boundary that requires effort to be to be focused and knowledge to be focused on an island scale at the maximum size. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, Jeff, I actually have a question for you. Um, so looking at the tools that you developed, um, do you have a, a concept of how folks use those and then, you know, building on um, the partnerships did actually reevaluate their goals? Um, well, we've had that happen at the, in discussions about um, the coral reef work. Um, that um, the folks from EPA and NOAA um, and us, we put together a workshop that looked at that. Um, and that actually led to, um, instead of just thinking about, let's preserve, you know, coral reef areas in perpetuity, it's, it, it refocused the goal in terms of how do we maintain, you know, or how do we foster recovery from bleaching events as opposed to just general let's keep reefs healthy because that's not actually one of your options anymore. So that's a, definitely a, a, an example of that. Um, in terms of the Hawaiian forest birds, which are in the situation of being um, basically forced up and up and up by warming temperatures that allow the mosquitoes to get up higher, um, it's, it's formed an actually ongoing reassessment of the goals for management of those species. Um, as I mentioned previously, the management has been uh, let's fence off the upper areas and get rid of the invasive species and everything will be fine. Um, that now is not, is not a, everybody acknowledges that's not a realistic uh, goal anymore. So now there's a lot of effort actually being focused on dealing with the um, disease problem itself, finding a way to uh, deal with mosquitoes at a large scale and reduce the, and essentially decouple the temperature rise, which is going to happen with the uh, disease system. So deep coupling temperature from the disease is the kind of the holy grail. And so we're working on a lot of innovative mosquito management um, involving um, genetic options, um, Bacterial parasite incompatibility, it's, it's kind of crazy. But we've, it, it's taken this shock and this, um, the, the stuff that Pixie has done showing that the previous plan is just not tenable in the long term, it's taken that to force this effort. Thank you. 
All right. Um, any other questions for Jeff today? Well, Jeff, um, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, I think, as you noted, we're we're dealing with some of the same issues um, on these on these big big problems. Um, it just to follow up, um, if we can get some more information on the micro modeling, that would be uh, really great, and I'll make sure that I get that sent out to folks who ask for it. Um, Tim is the one who asked specifically, but if anybody else on the phone would like me to provide that information, please send me an email. My email is gjohnson at usb as in boy r dot gov. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, I'll make sure that we, we get all of that out to folks who are interested. Um, again, just want to remind everybody that the webinar was recorded. Um, we are going to process it and then it will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with anybody or if you know anybody else who was interested um, but wasn't able to join today, we'll have that available. Again, thank you. Um, Jeff for presenting and, and thanks everybody for your time today and I look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks everyone. Aloha.